let me see if I have a YouTube link. Yes. All right, let me send it to you. Yes, I can use the chat. Uh, wait. There we go. So on this thing, you should have me. The weird thing is there will be, I think, a delay with the sound. So I, w I think I will mute myself on Blackboard because otherwise you will have the same sound but twice with some delay and it will be a bit confusing. But otherwise, yeah, I, I'm live on, on this YouTube link now. Okay, that's amazing. Felix, if you have the same sound it. twice with some delay. Alright, so yeah, I'm I'll mute myself on, on Blackboard. Uh, but I'll okay. still I still hear everyone. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. I'm checking with the chat, I think I can hear you. Okay, I can, I think I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. I think so. Okay. Good, uh, hi, Beth. Uh, we, we're having some issues, hi. Hi. Okay. Uh, we're having some issues with, uh, with Blackboard, so Matthew has moved to, uh, YouTube live and he just uh, sent the link there so I'm going to Okay. Uh, let's just uh, send the email so that we moved there. Oh, and otherwise I will also have a bit of delay between uh, Blackboard Blackboard and YouTube. You, you, you can leave. I'm just, I'm just keeping the session open so I can notify people. Sure, sure. I'll see you on YouTube. Bye. Yeah, bye, bye, bye. So, uh, yeah, do we start at five as we planned? Or wait a bit more for people to redirect? Yep. Can you hear me now, Matthew? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Yep.
of rotation error here. sure if everybody's here we have I think 15 people watching there uh, so yeah let me know if we can start or if, if um, some other people struggle to join the, the live let's see it's seven maybe two more minutes starting at nine So the YouTube live is uh, the YouTube live is recorded. Yeah, well, it, it keeps uh, it stays on the on the page, and I will also have a, a higher quality recording. I think higher quality, but anyway, a recording uh, locally that I can share with you afterwards. Thanks, Sebastian, for your question. Yeah, we'll, we'll answer this one, definitely. One of the goals of a, of a talk is to answer this kind of question. So it's yeah, it's nine. Uh, should we start? Okay, yeah, at, at ten, we can start moving on. So, um, okay, hi everyone, and yeah, so, sorry about the logistics, it's always when you need the most that the system goes down, obviously. So yeah, f thank you all for, for joining. So this would be the second part of uh, the series on learning Julia for the working scientist and the working engineer uh, at, uh, with the EME group. Yeah, thanks again so for to the EME group for, for organizing this. So uh, last time we were talking about Julia the programming language and uh, why it fits and how it fits uh, the picture of what we need for scientific programming in a large sense. Uh, today we are going to see something a bit different which will be a bit more well focused on Jump which is a library for constrained structured optimization and we will see what, what exactly I mean by that. So it would be more on optimization and less about generic uh, programming. And as last week, uh, so this is not completely up to date, but I update, update it, but the repo from last week is still the same. So there will be a second notebook, which is this one uh, with the content of a slide on it. All right. So uh, what I want to talk about is first how we model and how we represent optimization problems. 
uh, as, as scientists, as modelers. Um, so th that would be the first part. And the, the, let's say the two, we talk about the two big families of um, approaches on how to tackle and how to model optimization problems. Uh, then I will slide off a little bit on the side to talk about broadcast and macros, which are two features of Julia, which we didn't cover last week. Um, just to be sure that we, we, these are the two basic tools that we'll need that we didn't see last week for understanding what Jump does. Then we'll dive in with Jump, so what it is, what is the library, uh, what it is made for and how you use it, the core concepts of it, and then we will uh, get some more, get more practical with some few examples uh, using uh, using Jump for well, let's say realistic problems. Okay, so at any point, if you have questions, just leave them in the chat. I might not answer them directly, but if I don't answer them at some point, then uh, ask them again. All right. So um, the first thing will be how do we model optimization problems, and ideally. We would have uh, we would have our model, let's say our beautiful paper model, just plug that or plug even the LaTeX version in a programming language and get some solution, start solving it. Uh, that would be ideal because this would mean our our model our paper model would be exactly the same thing as the thing that that gets solved. And this is roughly the spirit of algebraic modeling languages. So an algebraic modeling language is a domain specific language as in it's specialized for optimization. So it's defining a, sp a certain syntax, a certain semantic, targeting uh, the, solu the, mod the model, yeah, targeting modeling uh, optimization problems. So here I took the same uh, problem as this one and roughly translated it to some syntax that is close enough to uh, AMPL, which is one of the algebraic modeling languages you might know. Uh, another one you might know is GAMS, for example. Um, and then you have a whole range of uh, algebraic modeling languages, which are specific to some of the big commercial uh, MILP solvers. Right. So uh, here on this example, you have a set of rows, a set of columns, and then you have your parameters, which are A and B. So your uh, your uh, matrix and right hand side, and then you define this var, which is your decision variable, x, which has n, col n, n calls elements in the set, and then uh, you minimize the function of this of the x subject to, and then you enumerate all your constraints. So this is not exactly the paper, but this is close enough, let's say. And the, the beauty of it is, so if you have this model declaration and you have your paper on the side, you can often compare the two and check that it remains consistent from one side to the other. So th this sounds pretty good, right? Well, there are some few things that are a bit bothering with algebraic modeling languages. Uh, and usually it comes down to how to the fact that we don't build models, solve them and call it a day. Usually when we solve optimization problems, we use custom algorithms. Uh, we adapt, uh, yeah. We adapt the solution procedure to the structure that we know. We have some specific insight on which cuts we could generate, or whether we could generate some new variables or some new columns or some new constraints uh, using some decomposition scheme or, or things like this. Um, there's also the problem of how, do, of how do you extend a custom language to incorporate new sets, for example. So. You want to extend your you want to extend AMPL to integrate a new fancy set. Well, you don't have a way to do it directly because it's it's a language that's baked for a certain amount of tasks. It's specialized for these tasks, right? So usually, when you're in an optimization lab, uh, people will tell you, uh, well, AMLs are good for starting. It's good for some some courses uh, to focus on modeling. But then at some point when you get serious about uh, building algorithms to solve problems, you end up um, using more uh, programming interfaces, um, which is the second family of approaches we'll see. So a programming interface is basically a solver which gives you a library and you use this library to um, you, yeah, you use this library to program your algorithm directly. So here you have an example of Cplex uh, directly taken from the tutorials. I removed some parts of it, but the, the spirit is roughly this. Uh, you create a model object that you mutate, you modify it by adding some variables, adding some constraints, 
and you do that within a generic programming language. Again, in this in this area here, we are using a, li uh, a solver as a library within any programming language. So it can be in Python, in uh, in Julia, in C++, and so on. And so here, for example, with a C++ example, so we create this model uh, within an environment that's declared before. Then you create some variables, uh, which are of a type dependent on the solver. You can add some variables. Well, yeah, you can add some variables here. Uh, you can add some constraints. And here, C++ is still not too bad because you can express constraints using this uh, linear, this quasi-linear expressions here. That's so that's not awful. It could. It's actually worse if you take the Java examples because you don't have arithmetic defined on everything. Um, and then, so you once you build, once you you've built your model, you can solve it and then fetch the results back. So uh, the nice thing here is again we are in a general programming environment which means that uh, you can use arbitrary programming constructs. So for loops, ifs, else, and so on. Um, so you can really design uh, a custom algorithm for the things you want to build on top of the algorithms that are offered by the solver. Uh, one big drawback, and that's been bothering me quite a lot, is that you depend on a solver directly. And a problem I often hear with people that hit some specific issues of some solvers is if you ask, well, okay, did you try some other solver then to compare? Is this issue really solver specific? And people would just throw their hands in the air and because um, converting something to another solver is just way too much work. It's, uh, it means basically throwing away your whole code and rewriting it within the new solver because all your types, all your declarations are specific to one solver and so you have to rewrite a lot of things. Um, and a, a last drawback of, of this approach is that you have a huge distance or a greater distance at least between the model, so the, the beautiful model you had on your paper at the beginning and its implementation, which means that keeping track of the two versions is fairly complex. Uh, you have more work to be sure that you have um, your, your paper and your model implemented uh, are up to date and cor really corresponding to each other and so on. So that's more chances for errors, but also that's more software skills required and this uh, this can be a barrier to entry for people coming, for example, from a math background uh, that are that have very str a very strong focus on the um, on the modeling part on the and that want to focus on the modeling part and not on the implementation details of uh, keeping track of the memory of CPLEX and so on. Right. Uh, the last family we'll see is, and the one we focus on, is called Embedded Algebraic Modeling Languages, so EAML. And the principle is basically embedding a given uh, your modeling language within another general purpose programming language. So examples of these are, well, Jump, which we will see today, but also um, Gravity in C++, um, or uh, Pulp and uh, YALMIP in Python. So you have some in, in different programming languages and their principle is often the same. It's offering a unified interface for, so it's solver independent interface for modeling problems. But since you're in an, a host language, uh, you can embed what you write. So the code you write, you can embed it in other larger constructs. So you can build libraries on top of it and so on. But you can also use other tools from your favorite programming language because you are within it. Uh, and yeah, it, of, it also offers a familiar syntax, so it focuses on giving a familiar syntax for optimizers, so something closer to the model than you would have with uh, solver libraries. Right, and so jump is the one we're focusing on, so this is an EAML for Julia, so it stands for Julia Mathematical Programming. Uh, and these were two random facts about it, so the first is it's almost as old as Julia itself, so uh, if you check the, the PhD thesis, which was the, let's say the initial creation of uh, Julia programming language, uh, Jump itself is mentioned is in the appendix as one of the use cases of Julia. It was creating this, uh, this uh, EAML for, um, for structured optimization. And second random fact was uh, Jump is, uh, is getting fairly big as an organization, as uh, an ecosystem of, uh, 
yeah, uh, computing libraries for optimization. And it's, uh, it's uh, supported as an organization within them focus, which is supporting other big organizations for scientific programming. So in you have Pandas, SciPy, in Python, Jupyter, Stan, uh, Julia itself, some other C++ libraries and so on. So its aim is to, unif to get a unified modeling interface. So unified in the sense that it's uh, unifying different solvers. You don't have a solver specific uh, syntax. And yeah, it's uh, especially good for structured constrained optimization. Uh, do we have some questions at, at this point? If you have some, just drop them in the chat and, and I'll answer. Otherwise, uh, so we'll continue. Um, so, to talk about Gem, I wanted to give you two Julia notions on the side. Uh, the first one will be macros. So we didn't see them last time. We saw functions. Functions are basically uh, a piece of code that takes some input and produces some output in any way. Okay. Uh, so here you have an example. f of x would be a function. A macro has a special syntax, so it take, it has always uh, this at at the beginning. So f will be a function, and at f will be here a macro. Okay. And instead of taking values in parameters, it takes some code in parameter, and it does something to this code. So it can it can manipulate the code, it can transform it, and then execute it, and so on. Uh, do we have a question? Oh, no. Okay. So here, as an example, imagine you have this function f, which takes an input, the composition of a function uh, g of x. And um, so what happens normally in that case is, so you provide an x, a g of x would be computed, for example, x is 2 and g of x would be 4, and then this value 4 will be passed to f, which then computes something out of it. Okay. Now, if you have a macro uh, at f of g of x, what the macro will take is the code g of x itself, almost like a string g of x. Like this. It's not a string, it's a specific structure, but it's almost like it. You can think of it like this. So the at f macro will take this code, and then you can do arbitrary things with it. So you can manipulate it, ins ins inspect it, and so on. So a good example of macro we actually saw last week was the at show macro which is taking some code, uh, printing the code itself, so the expression, then evaluating this expression, and then showing you the result. Okay, So here, uh, I'm, I'm giving show this expression, 1 plus 3 plus rand, which will compute a random number. So if show was a mac, uh, function, sorry, I would first evaluate this, so do 4 plus a random number and then provide this, but now it's a macro so it takes the code directly and show takes the code and represent the code, so that's the result of show here. Show will take uh, will take this code, uh, display it, then add an equal and then evaluate the code and give me the result. Okay, so that's the first notion I wanted to give you, macro take code, uh, yeah macros take code and they do something with it, so compute something out of this code. And the second notion I wanted to add is uh, is called broadcasting. So if you're coming from MATLAB or Octave, uh, it might be very familiar. It's basically the notion of applying a function or an operation element-wise. So here I have this A matrix, 0, 1, 1, 0. And I can square it, which will basically be equivalent to doing A times A. Okay, And I can also... Uh, square it but element wise this time and this time it will be each element individually which will be squared okay so in this in the case of a squared this will give me the identity matrix here because this is a times a in the second case I'm applying this uh, hat here this exponent element wise because of this dot and so this will basically not change anything because the elements are zeros and ones um, how to use the output for um, Seb Sebastian? I'm not sure. So I have a bit of delay, I think, when, when I talk. So uh, which output are you referring to in the question? Yeah, in the meantime, I'll continue. And yeah, feel free to complete the answer, the question and I answer. Right, so macros take code and do something with it. Broadcasting just applies a function element-wise. 
uh, how to use the output for other purposes right so um, so this a macro can also take this code and evaluate it um, and so the output of the expression can be computed and then you can use it several times or things like this uh, what you have is basically it represents the, the code as a specific structure, so an expression in Julia. And then you can get uh, what is this what is the type of this expression, what are the elements of it. So here that would be a function call on plus with these arguments here. So you can really manipulate the code as a list, I think. But yeah, we won't get into details. We won't use macros in an advanced way. It's just to explain you what this funny hat and uh, what this funny at here is. Right, so we'll import uh, jump here, which is the library, and then these two we'll see later. And then we'll dive in. Okay, so how do we create a jump model? Well, first we create this model object here, uh, which I'll call M in that case. And then we can start adding things to our model. So in that case, I uh, will start by adding some variables. Um, so here I will add to my model M a variable X, which would be a simple scalar variable, unconstrained or anything. In the second case, I'm adding a variable y, which will be bounded between 1 and pi. Okay. Then uh, I will add a variable z, which in that case would be a matrix of variables uh, from 1 to 5 in rows and 1 to 10 in columns. And this would be a, a, a matrix of binary variable represented by this bin here. Uh, and then, so let's do something a bit more complex. Sometimes you have, you don't have flat indices, but you have de indices depending on some context. So I'm, here I'm going to create a three-dimensional array. So I have three axes uh, of a variable called delta, and they will be lower bounded by two. And then, so here I see that my first axis is called i, second j, and the third k. And so the first one is always 1 to 5, but the second one, I, or, I only have variables defined for j equal i to j equal to i. Okay. And here my bound will also be dependent on which uh, place in my array I am at. So my bound will be dependent on i itself. And so one, use, one interesting use case for this is, for example, if, you're, if you have variables on graphs, on the edges of a graph specifically, uh, then you have, um, then you can have your i j, so your your variable on, uh, defined over i and j, only if there is an arc or an edge from i to j, and nothing otherwise. Um, a question: So, are there speed issues with having non-flat indices? Um, no. So there will be some some I think some very neglectable delay but nothing major and in any case this is passing everything to your to your model afterwards so you can have a bit of delay at cons on constructing the model but not during the, the solution process because otherwise afterwards it's going to be passed to a solver right and as a last example so we have indexed variables over integers only, so z of 1 and 3, delta of 3, 4, 5, and so on. Here we're going to create something a bit fancier, which will be, uh, pr so we will have a product type, which would be a vector of strings, okay? And then uh, out of this product type, I will, well, I will index using the product type a new variable, so a new variable called grocery list, and so the index here will be one of the product types. So I can in, uh, I can index it with uh, flour, with egg, or with milk. And this would be a vector of positive integer decision variables. So yeah, that's roughly it for creating variables. So we've created all the variables here on one single model. I will add a last variable here, which would be a number of pancakes, okay, which will also be a positive integer. And now let's start adding some constraints. So the first constraint would be a very simple one, uh, an unnamed constraint. So again, using an, a macro, at constraint, to my model. And I will simply use this expression here. So x has, x has to be smaller than 3y in my model. Um, then I will add some constraints. But just like an, I can add a name to a variable, I can also add a name to a constraint. So in that case, I'm adding the name here. So I'm creating a constraint m, adding um, 
uh, with the name recipe constraint egg and my constraint will be my number of pancakes defined above has to be smaller than three times my grocery list of egg and again you see here how we use this string index if you have this is fairly useful if you have some variable types that depend on something qualitative and not quantitative then instead of remembering that one is the type for egg and two is the type for flour you can just use the natural indices for your decisions and yeah so we, we are creating roughly three times the same constraints with just different values and different corresponding uh, grocery list types here so let's make something a bit more compact uh, but before that, yeah, one one thing uh, I think is fairly underrated with Jump is that again you are you are in your normal programming environment, which means you can interactively create your model, but also see what the model looks like. So for debugging, this is super useful. You can just print M, which is my model here, and it will get me a string representation of my model. And so here my model is a feasibility model because I didn't add any objective, so it means it's a minimize zero, for example and then subject to some constraints uh, which are so here my first simple constraints uh, you see it renormalized it by passing all the variables to the left hand side and then my named constraints here and then I have all my variables with their bounds afterwards right so let's make things a, a bit more compact um, so we have here a dictionary which will contain my ingredient types and then associated to a value which would be the, the quantity limit I had before and so instead of defining my constraint three times with a grocery with a number of pancake constraints I will just loop over my product and the quantity and add a constraint here which would be number of pancake has to be smaller than the quantity times the grocery list of product so again uh, this is this is just normal Julia code and you can manipulate your normal data structures your type your dictionaries and so on uh, and I will do exactly the same thing for the objective now. We'll finally set an objective. And here I will say that I have some prices for my three ingredients. And my objective, which I also add with a macro here. Uh, so the objective of my model M will be to minimize. And the sum, and I do a sum comprehension here, which is sum of something for something in a set. Uh, just like a list comprehension or set comprehension in, in mathematics. So I will sum my price times the grocery list of product for product and price in this dictionary here. So product would be flour, egg and milk and price would be the 0, 3, 1 and 2 which corresponds. And here I get a, an output to verify that I really have a correct result. So it would be 0, 3, my grocery list of flour, grocery list of eggs, it's, it's what I wanted. Okay, So it's pretty printing more or less except some minor bugs. It's pretty print, printing me uh, the the objective value uh, sorry the objective function that I computed uh, a question here so if constraints are created anonymous how can we retrieve information about them uh, dual what would be the best way so it's a good question if you create a constraint anonymously uh, you don't have a name for it and so you can retrieve it with uh, the the object the the model dictionary so there's a dictionary which stores the names you defined I think uh, but I think the best way is always to define your constraints with a name if you know you will compute something out of this constraint so get the dual for example right so we have our model it's fairly ready now so we have variables we have constraints we set an objective um, so yeah let's try to solve it and the thing I did here is when I prepared this presentation I made uh, I think three mistakes or at least two mistakes and I decided to keep them because you might also hit the same mistakes and uh, be interested in seeing uh, what happens then. So the first mistake is I try to optimize without thinking thinking too much and the result is so I try to optimize my model with this function here and um, what I get is an error no optimizer and indeed we said that jump is a modeling language or a modeling uh, library let's say it's not a solving a library so jump is just here to represent your problem uh, but we need something underlying jump or we need a solver to actually do the, the real work and what we so what we need to do is set the actual optimizer of my problem so uh, to fix this we'll call this set optimizer and I will set the optimizer of M to be CLP optimizer 
Uh, you might be familiar with CLP, so this is a linear optimization solver from the CoinOR uh, suit. So it's solving linear optimization problems, continuous ones. And then I try to optimize again. Uh, and in that case, so I get a new error, which is unsupported constraint. And I don't support single variables in 0, 1. So what happens here? Well, if you remember correctly, my model had this uh, this number of pancake variables, but also these z variables, which are either binary or integer. And my solver doesn't support that because my solver here, CLP, is just a linear optimization solver. It doesn't do integer optimization. So the error I get here is, well, I do I do know this solver, I do know this problem, but these two are not compatible because you try to express a problem that cannot be tackled by this solver. And so here in that case, uh, what we do is we change the solver, and so we change it to CBC, which is the integer optimization cousin or even big brother of uh, CLP. And so CBC can tackle these our 0, 1 variables, but also our integer variables. In that case, so I'm setting the optimizer and, um, and optimizing, and this time I get something printed from, C, uh, from CBC itself. And it's printing quite a lot. And I see at the end, optimal solution fine, which, which is good. Uh, so yeah, this is good news. We managed to optimize our problem. But it's still a bit verbose. Uh, C CBC is printing a lot of things. If you're solving this in a loop, in an algorithm or anything, uh, you might get tired of seeing uh, this huge block of text every time. So what you can do instead is use this uh, math opt interface uh, sub-library which is included in jump and then we can set in the model the attribute silent to true. Okay, And then we re-optimize and here I don't see any output below. Uh, the only thing I have is silence and it actually re-optimized it. Okay. We have a question, so how do we use the dict function? So dict is um, here it's not uh, so it's it's not a function from jump it's really it's a, a structure from julia itself and so a dictionary is associating some keys to some values and you have different ways of creating it so you can create either an empty dictionary with dict uh, opening and closing parentheses uh, but you can also create a dictionary with a key an error like this so equal and uh, greater than and a value and you can do several of these and it will create a dictionary of string to float64 here. And so this is really um, yeah, uh, a key value store and so when you have a dictionary like this, you can index it afterwards. Uh, so you can either iterate so and get the keys and the values at the same time like that. Or you can also do product quantities, square brackets and your keys and you will get the value which corresponds. But yeah, good question. I didn't talk about dictionaries last time, so yeah, it might be irrelevant to know. So it's it's really like a, an address book. You have some key entries and you check, do I have a value and which value do I have for this? Right, so this this is fine and we are there. So now we, I think, or we think we solved our optimization problem. So let's see what happened. So uh, let's get some results. Uh, the first thing to want, uh, we might wonder about is, did my optimization uh, algorithm terminate? Did it terminate correctly, and so on? And so the function in jump to to check that is usually termination status, uh, which is roughly asking, did something go wrong, or am I good? And here I see that my termination status for my model is optimal, so that sounds good. Uh, the second thing you can ask, especially if you have some, some specific classes of problems, is what is my primal status? So do I have primal information and do I have dual information? And so here primal status would be feasible point, so I'm optimal with a feasible primal point, that, that sounds good. And I have no dual solution, again because uh, I'm, in an, uh, I'm on an integer optimization problem and so talking about duals here doesn't make sense, and so I don't have a dual defined. Uh, otherwise, if I was in a linear optimization on a linear optimization problem, I would have a um, a solution also for the dual. Right. Um, so once I get that, uh, the thing I want to do usually is get my actual solution, 
and we can do that with uh, jump dot value f the jump dot value function. So you can call jump dot value on any of your variables. So here, for example, x was one of them, and I can get I can get the the actual final value with jump dot value here. Uh, I can also get the objective value on my model, which was also zero. And then I can also call jump value on a collection. So here Z was a matrix of uh, binary variables, and I can get the value of uh, of Z with this dot here. So again, I have to use broadcast because I have multiple elements. And so this this dot here will be applying the jump dot value function element wise. So on each element of Z. Right. Um, so I can not only get the value for single variables, but I can also get value for arbitrary expressions. So imagine you have um, you have an optimization problem and you have an expression that's interesting to you. So for example, it might be the total revenue you get from an optimization problem, even though it doesn't appear in the objective or it's not in the constraints or anything. But you have a combination of your variables which gets you some expression of interest. So here what I can do is I can just use my variable x and my variable z and combine them in some way. So here, x minus sum of z is giving me this uh, linear expression. And I can get the value for this expression itself. So x minus sum of z. And so this is really practical sometimes to avoid manipulating only the variables, but also complete more complex expressions. And I, I can also verify that my models doesn't have duals. So here jump has dual on my model gives me false. So it means if I try to get the dual of a constraint, I'm going to get an error. Otherwise, if my model has a dual, then I can query the duals of these constraints. Right. Uh, so we have afterwards advanced, advanced example. Do we have some, some questions at this point? So we, we saw the basic workflow of uh, using jump for mixed integer, linear problems, uh, verifying our solutions, constructing our model, and so on. If not, I'll take a bit of water and continue. Right, so uh, let's dive in, in some more advanced examples. So I hope I don't have people hating statistics here because my two examples are, are about it so sorry if you if you're panicked with linear regression so yeah uh, the first one would be yeah, uh, of course linear uh, regularized linear regression so uh, as a refresher linear regression is a model where you have uh, some variables x, a variable, a variable x and a variable y and you think that well you think that you can predict y with ax plus b um, and so you assume that there is this combination x plus b which is e roughly equal to y plus an error um, oh, I have some questions before where can I find the worksheet? So the so the notebook will be available on the same repo as last week. I'll post a link. There will be a link at, at the end to get the repo. Um, and one other question: Can you use symmetric matrices and semi-definite programming? That's perfect. We will see that right after. Almost spoiling the end. Right. So here uh, I'm generating some data so I'm gonna generate some X uh, an X variable with a hundred points and a Y variable with a hundred points uh, randomly and then adding a linear t a term uh, linearly dependent on on X and a constant so I'm getting roughly this uh, so zero is here and so I get this slope that falls that arrives at zero three looking like this right so we will solve a, a, so a regression problem, which is a quadratic problem, usually. And we'll solve a penalized regression problem. So let's dive in. So the first thing is, we will create this regression model, okay, here. Add a variable A, add a variable B, and then we'll create an expression. So it's a new macro here. So it's not creating a constraint, but simply an expression that we can then reuse either in a constraint or in the objective. And so my expression will be for each uh, for each data point i in one to a hundred, 
the difference between my predicted y, which is a times xi plus b, and the actual y. Okay, and I will square this error here. Okay, uh, to get something that I want to minimize to get as close as possible to zero. So this would be my, f and then I will set my objective. So the first term of my objective will be so to minimize this sum of errors, and then that's the new thing. I will have this penal uh, this uh, this penalty parameter lambda, which I will take for lambda in a range of values here. Okay. And what this penalty parameter does is penalize greater values of a and b. So when lambda gets greater, I expect my a and b to be uh, to become smaller because I'm penalizing them more. Okay. And then so I I set my optimizer to silent. I optimize my my regression problem. So this is now my my model, just like we had uh, m before. And then when I get the value, I will push the value a onto my vectors a. So I start with an empty a's here, a values here, and I will add, I will push these new values afterwards. And I will do the same thing with b. So I will start with empty vectors and collect for each value of a penalty parameter, I will collect a new a and I will collect a new b. Oops. Right. So uh, from this point on, we can represent our solution. So here, I'm not going to go into the details of, of the plot part, but I'm representing my, my data points and then my lines. And so we see that for small lambda parameters, my line is fitting fairly well. OK, this is roughly what I would expect. And then when I increase this, uh, this lambda, I see my slope decreasing because I'm penalizing larger values of A. And so in the end, when I'm getting harsher and harsher with a penalty, I'm getting away from my uh, from the best fitting solution, but with smaller and uh, smaller a and b. So he, yeah, so this was uh, an excuse to show you mostly quadratic that you can have quadratic expressions without any problem. We didn't change anything about our model except we have we have this quadratic expression here and here. Okay. And we also have a different optimizer. So here, you see that I set the optimizer directly in the model, but it doesn't change anything. And I swap directly, instead of using a linear optimizer like CLP or an integer optimizer like CBC, I swapped it for IPOP, which is a nonlinear optimizer supporting quadratic constraints. Right. Uh, one thing we did, we did, which was not super smart, uh, if we go back to the to the model here is that for every lambda, we recreate a new regression model from scratch. So we create the model, we create the variables, the expression, and so on. While the only thing that changes is this lambda in the objective function. So this term here changes, the rest does not. Okay. And so what we can do instead, uh, to make things a bit smarter and faster, is to create our model here. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing. Uh, create my regression model, add the variables a and b, okay. Uh, my, cre recreate my my quadratic expression. Sorry here, and then I will only uh, so in the loop here. So in the lambda loop, I will only change the objective. So call this at objective regression to set the objective to this part, and then optimize and push. So uh, this means either jump or my solver will keep in cache my model and not change it, except for the objective value or the objective function. And so it will recreate the objective function and then resolve it, but without changing the rest of it. So it would be faster to create the model and solve, or at least we'll create the model just once. Right, uh, do we have some questions on the linear regression part? Okay, so uh, if no particular question, so we saw a quadratic model, we saw linear models, now let's move on. And to move on, I found, I dug into uh, some some vintage papers, so something from 2003, with some familiar names uh, that you might know from, from Edinburgh here, or, and also from the rest of the UK. So this will, sorry, be again a statistics application. And we'll use statistics for uh, the estimation of a correlation matrix. So we have some data and we want to 
get a matrix that's as close as possible to a correlation matrix for this data. So this means we will get, so we have the, the correlation of the experimental matrix X here, and we have, um, so we have our variable which is itself a matrix, okay, and it has to be a correlation matrix, which means it needs to be semi-definite positive, that's an essential property, and we, ha we need to have a diagonal with only ones, okay, so that's another constraint. And finally, we'll add a, a new touch to, to this paper by adding some constraints that for some pairs of ij's, we need to have a correlation being zero. Uh, this can happen, for example, if you know structurally from your domain knowledge from the model, you know that some variables are independent. And in that case, you can force the correlation on these to be zero. And then the, the optimization uh, algorithm will adapt to get you a correlation matrix that's still valid, but that incorporates this knowledge. Right. So let's dive in. So here I will first generate my data with uh, the statistics function. Uh, I will have dimensions six and I will create three first variables, so uh, normally distributed with a thousand points. And then I will create a thousand more points with also three dimensions, but that would be correlated a bit with the first ones. So this means there will be x1, 2, and 3 correlated with x4, uh, 5, and 6 uh, respectively. Okay, And if I compute my, my correlation matrix here, I get so a 6 by 6 matrix, my diagonal is uh, only once, and I have all the other terms roughly equal to 0 except these here, uh, which are close to 75%. So 75, 74, 74. Okay. So I have some data with some, some interesting correlations at some point and the rest should be just noise. So let's create our model. Again, I'm going to use a new solver, uh, this time because I have a semi-definite, uh, positive semi-definite constraint. So I need a conic solver to, to tackle this. So we'll use SCS here, which is also open source and use the linear algebra package for a diagonal, I think. Right, so I will create my model, which is a new model with SCS optimizer, which I will call, uh, call sparse core. I will set it to silent again, and I will create a variable, and that's the only new thing, which would be a matrix of one by n, one by n, which will be directly in the PSD cone. So here I will cr I'm creating a matrix directly as a PSD matrix, and this is a constraint on the variable directly, on the type of variable, if you will. Uh, you can also create symmetric matrices directly, but in that case, we want it to be uh, PSD, okay? Uh, the other way you can do it is creating first a, a matrix variable and then adding a constraint that this matrix has to be in the positive semi-definite cone. These are the two ways of, of doing it. Right, so that's the first step uh, with this PSD cone. Uh, then we will add a constraint, which is that so we will name our constraint unit diagonal, and this will correspond to the fact that the diagonal of C of my, of my matrix has to be one. So each individual element has to be one. Right, and finally we will add our sparsity pattern, which will be for ij in these pairs, I know that uh, these variables are independent from another, so one and two have to be independent, one and three have to be independent, and so on. And for all of these, I will set as a constraint that my element Cij has to be zero. And I don't need to reverse it because with a PSD cone, the C matrix needs to be uh, symmetric. And so I need, uh, so I just need to set one of the Ij's to zero and the other will automatically be zero. Okay. And finally, I will set my objective, which is, uh, if you remember the gap between my matrix C and the actual correlation matrix of my initial data uh, core of x. And so I will use the sum of c minus score of x element y squared. Okay. And finally, uh, like usual, we can just optimize it just like we did with the other problems and get the value. And so here I get something that's quite satisfying. So my diagonal is ones. Uh, the rest of my data is roughly noise close to zero and I get back my high correlation uh, items here. So I'm fairly satisfied. And of the items, on the items I force to zero, I get something that's uh, close to zero with respect to solver tolerances, which is higher than uh, the, 
the tolerance on the on floating point numbers, for example. So yeah, that's good enough here. All right. Do I have some question for the uh, semi-definite problem here, or for semi-definite modeling? Right, so um, if not, we can continue. And so we saw two examples, sorry, the two again were, were in statistics. And, uh, oh, one question, are matrices symmetric by default? No, absolutely not. So they're only symmetric if you, if you ask, the, if you declare them as symmetric matrix, matrices. So this means, for example, um, here, instead of declaring C in PSZ cone, I will have to declare it explicitly in symmetric. Uh, otherwise, if I just create C like this, this doesn't have to be symmetric. Right, um, sorry. So one thing I wanted to show you is uh, two types of model transformations. So this model object from Jump that we're creating is just a plain data structure. This means we can manipulate it, we can transform it, we can pass it to other packages and so on. Um, so one good example of uh, why this is useful is dualization.jl. So this is a package which computes the dual of your optimization problem automatically. And this is fairly useful because some solvers don't support uh, the two forms of conic problems. They just support one of them. So for example, variable in cone or a fine map in cone. So you have to choose one of them and well, the solver chooses for you and you have to convert everything to this form. But if you if you just dualize your problem, then you can pass the dual to the solver if it doesn't support it. Uh, so let's see what it looks like. So here I'm using this dualization package. So this was my sparse core problem. So the the PSD problem for correlation matrices. And now I will dualize it. So what I do is I call dualization dualize sparse core. I give it an optimizer directly attached. And then I will just give it dual names to uh, give it a correspondence between the primal names, so the names of the constraints, of the primal constraints, and the names for the duals. So in that case, I'm just leaving it empty, so it would be the same names. And here what I get is a dual, a sp a dual of the sparse correlation matrix problem. So it's a bit ugly, but it's the same problem, so it's automatically converted. And so my dual sparse is also a jump model, so I can just also set it to silent and optimize it. And then what I can do is uh, verify that my objective value for the primal and the dual are roughly identical, again, up to solver precision. And so here I get, I compute the objective value of my dual sparse minus the objective value of my primal sparse, and I verify that this is not zero, but this is uh, roughly okay. Okay, uh, so that was it for, for dualization. And uh, one last thing about it is, so I showed why, why people use it for solver compatibility, but the biggest use case I see is verifying your duals. Uh, at least in my case, I often make mistakes when computing duals, or I have to verify a lot of times that I, I was correct on the indices of one matrix on the other, uh, especially when, you're, when you have sparse structures and lar very large problems. So having this dualization.jl package is fairly useful to just compute the dual, print it, and verify that I didn't make mistakes in my indices, in my uh, transposition, in the transposition of the constraints, and so on. So that's that's fairly invaluable for this. The second type of model transformation I wanted to show you is, um, oh yeah, thanks, yeah. Uh, so the second type of model transformation I wanted to show you quite quickly is uh, computing the extreme vertices of a, poly, of a polyhedron. So you have your feasible set just defined as a simple jump model and you can use this Julia polyhedra poly, oh yeah, typo here, sorry. So the Julia polyhedra uh, organization here or ecosystem which defines this polyhedra library and I can just create a jump model, add variables to it, constraints and compute the polyhedron of this and the V representation, which is the, the vertex representation of this polyhedron. And so here, 
my model is basically the unit simplex and I get the so and I get the extreme vertices which are all the points at at zero one or something. Right, uh, so that was it. I didn't want to spend too much time on, on this one. And uh, yeah, so this is roughly it. I wanted to finish on two conclusions. Uh, the first one is, uh, I hope I convinced you that jump is really good for some use cases. So I wanted to hold back on some others. The first one would be, so nonlinear optimization is still a work in progress in jump. Uh, again, this is a personal opinion and doesn't reflect anyone else's uh, uh, opinion of jump or, or, or of anything. But so there is uh, support for nonlinear optimization, but it's still a work in progress, and it's not, it has not been the core focus of jump itself. Again, jump leverages the structure of your problem and knowing the structure of your problem in advance. So in in that case, you have more suited tools. So if you really don't know anything about your functions, you can check black box of Tim. Or I think there's uh, the Nomad Solver coming soon to Julia, uh, which was developed in, in Montreal. If you have um, smooth functions and uh, very simple constraints, uh, so you're in the, let's say, traditional nonlinear optimization uh, framework, then you can check either the Julia NL solvers and Julia Smooth Optimizers, the two tackle this kind of, of problem. And finally, if you have problems on manifolds, I think only on smooth manifolds, you can help, you can check the, the manup package and the Julia manifold organization. And a last point in the drawbacks will be, so jump is still dependent on float64, uh, unlike, let's say, other Julia libraries or most Julia libraries. So all of the Julia goodness that I showed you last week about using complex numbers, uh, symbolic numbers, autodiff and so on, will not work with jump directly. It will work with the underlying layer, which is called uh, math out interface, but with jump you're still with uh, float64. Right, and so this is this is it for me. So yeah, to wrap up, if you have to take something from this presentation, so jump and EAML in general, I think are a great compromise and should be generalized and push more in education and research. Uh, as yeah, a great a great trade-off between uh, being model friendly and so math people friendly also, and algorithm friendly on the other side, and also it's library friendly, so you can build on top of them and compose jump with other things. Uh, this is also one I think one of the rare tools in that area, really bridging different classes of optimization problems, from LP, integer, conic, and you have you have people developing. Um, solvers for targeting specifically jump and math opt interface now which are uh, which are really um, taking well specialized in one field while not being um, stuck by jumps generality so you have people developing uh, constraint programming solvers you have people developing um, column generation column uh, row generation frameworks for faulty compositions uh, Tulip, which is an inter point method uh, using ast abstract algebra. So these ones are really leveraging Julia's features and uh, yeah, getting very well useful, um, yeah, useful for free features out of Julia and directly compatible with Jump. And so I didn't show you that many examples here because uh, we also have a repo, uh, Jump Tutorials, which contains more advanced things uh, and more. Uh, application oriented things. So if you're looking at uh, power system applications, uh, if you're looking at um, uh, let's, uh, graph applications also, uh, th this is where you, you should be looking at. Um, so a question, is there a neat way of detecting if a data item hasn't been defined? Uh, AMPL will want this, yes. So. Uh, AMPL is a, is a bit specific on that because, or let's say algebraic modeling languages are specific for that because you first define, you use data before you define them, uh, which would be like uh, defining int x in C++ and then not initializing it. Uh, in Julia, you, you cannot do that. So you create data or you declare data by uh, initializing it. And this means, so, Again, you're, you're just in Julia here, uh, independently of jump. And so if at some point I create uh, this, this constraint, 
oops I go back here so if I create this this constraint which depends on my data X X has to be defined that would be the first possibility or uh, I'm for example in a function that takes X in input and solve my optimization problem but you don't have uh, data that can be used without being defined this will just be an error So again, unlike unlike AMPL, you are in a general purpose programming environment. So you cannot have uh, data used or even bindings, so names used without being defined somewhere before. Right, I'll go back to the last page for the for the links if we have other questions. So one question, are there any attempt to do a Julia solver? So I assume this will be a pure Julia solver instead of calling uh, CLP, CBC, and so on. So yes, uh, these two here are pointers to pure Julia solvers. So Tulip is uh, so is solving linear optimization problems using um, using the interior point method instead of simple instead of a simplex. So that would be a first one. Uh, then I pointed to constraint solver, which is so a pure Julia implementation. So it's a Julia solver for constraint programming. So in this case, in the combinatorial world. So I wanted to have these two examples because I've I've worked a bit with them, with them and seen them. Uh, otherwise, you have way more solvers for let's say more advanced and modern classes of of problems. So you have uh, one being developed at Oxford for semi-definite optimization. I think using uh, ADMM, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, ADDM, sorry. Uh, you also have some solvers being developed for mixed integer conic uh, optimization uh, at, at the MIT. Um, so Hypatia, I've, yeah, Hypatia is one of the recent ones. I didn't post it here because it's still uh, so the paper is out but the we're still waiting for for the code but yeah otherwise you have already especially in the in the Koenig world you have already a bunch of uh, solvers being developed or already at a at a major stage major put it in quote And uh, otherwise, these uh, so the Julia Smooth optimizers are so defining nonlinear solvers, but they are compatible with Jump, so you can use them from Jump. And so these are also uh, nonlinear solvers. Uh, for MILPs compared to uh, commercial ones, what makes the speed, what makes the speed difference? Uh, it's a good question. So I I don't know of any. M A my M I L P solver de developed in pure Julia. So, for example, you are still using the the either the commercial ones or the open source ones, uh, whatever. But the ones defined in in C uh, built in C and C plus plus. And we, I think, one of the reasons for this is that it takes a lot of time and a lot of uh, tuning to develop a M an M I L P solver. And so, doing that from scratch is very ambitious. Uh, I'll give a high here to the Hikes team uh, in Edinburgh doing tackling this problem, and so yeah, it's it's a big topic and it's not. I'm not sure it's worth it to do it in pure Julia except for some specific features like Autodiff, for example, or the generic numeric type. But yeah, otherwise there was a question at the very beginning that I maybe didn't answer. Let me check it back about uh, skip so uh, yeah to answer a question at the beginning I didn't use JLPK here but this is completely supported and skip also I'm um, uh, skip is the solver I'm generally using for my research Uh, 
uh, also I don't know if, there's, if there are questions on, on Blackboard but uh, I got disconnected and can't get back in it seems so yeah if there are questions on Blackboard and if someone can uh, get it back to me I'd appreciate it Okay, question. So if we define the, the optimization model as a function of parameters, can we build a loop that solves the model for different defined values of these parameters? Yes, exactly. So this is what I wanted to do with a linear regression problem here, um, which is basically, so here I put it just at the top level, so in my, in my notebook, but you can def definitely put this in a function and your function can take, for example, lambda as a parameter and solve your optimization problem and at the end you return instead of pushing it to a vector here you will return a and b as solutions and so you can this is usually what i'm doing so what i have in most of my research is a function that builds the model except for tiny things that i change afterwards and then it passes this model and parameters and then i solve it with this final these final parameters so for example my build function my build model will be creating this uh, so setting things up let's say uh, up to here and then so I this creates my model and then I pass this and lambda to a second question and the sec uh, to a second uh, function and the second function will take this model and lambda and solve it and so second thing how do you print get variable value from the model if it is a function so um, the two ways I, I do it is either you, um, you from your function you return the model, uh, the variables, and the objective value, which is usually what you need, and then you do things afterwards. So your function returns these three things, and then you do things with it. The second way is when you create a jump model, there's a dictionary inside, which is a ob object dictionary so as a field of your model structure and this object dictionary contains a dictionary from names so the names you defined to objects and so some for example it will contain some keys with your variables so here my model object will contain uh, a b and quad error so because these are the three names i define in my um, in my optimization model and so if you have just your model and you don't have the variables, you can get back the variables if they have a name from this dictionary. Um, okay, next question. If every time you call optimize, will it modify the, uh, the model object? Uh, if you call two consecutive times optimize, will, it tr will the server remember some information? Uh, yes. So if there was no modification at all from to the model, I think this is not re-optimized, I think, uh, but this this is solver dependent because um, uh, I don't think I, I don't think Jump makes assumptions on it. So Jump can cache your model. For example, if I'm modifying my model and resolving it multiple times, like I'm doing here, uh, so some solvers don't support that. You can only do one shot. Uh, so you build your model and you solve it all at once. In that case, Jump will store a cache of your model and only pass it to the optimizer when it's solving it. Um, so some solvers will remember it, some, some will not. And Jump will just make it work for all of them by keeping this cache of the, of the optimization problem as it is now and just passing it to the solver when it's ready. Uh, next question, in terms of licensing, if someone wants to do, let's say, a commercial model or service based on drill libraries, are there any requirements or restrictions? So, um, so for Julia libraries, not at all. So Julia is MIT licensed, so you can repackage it in for commercial purposes and so on. And same thing with Jump. Jump is MIT licensed, so it means you can create applications on top of Jump for industrial for industrial applications, but also for commercial solvers and so on. So you don't have any issues with that. But it, it always depends on the library you're using. So some libraries will choose, they, they choose their own license, just like you would choose your own license if you're building a Julia library. So you can choose to get a, a license that forces the next user to be, uh, to open source it. 
but uh, this is not the case for Jump. So Jump again is MIT license, which is a fairly, fairly permissive uh, license for applications. Right, so do you know if there's a project to model from uh, LaTeX to Jump directly or something like that? Uh, yeah, so Jump to LaTeX is feasible and it's actually what uh, Jump is doing when you ask for output. Do I have an example here? No. Yes, here for example, uh, when I'm in a notebook, this will output some LaTeX. Uh, and this is printing printed as LaTeX. But I think you can get the LaTeX value. So in that sense, it's easy. You have a model and you construct the appropriate LaTeX for it. But from LaTeX to optimization, I don't think I, I'm not even sure how how feasible that would be because th this seems very, very hard to build a compiler from LaTeX to something computable. Uh, th this might be interesting though, but I'm not aware of anything like that. Uh, even for graphs, it's the same thing where, well, the plots function have a possi uh, possible LaTeX output, so you can have some ticks image in LaTeX out of a plot, but going from LaTeX to uh, Julia plot or even to Julia objects might be close to impossible, I think. Um, if we have no further question, I guess we can uh, stop the, the stream there. Yeah, and uh, yeah, potentially move back to, to Blackboard if you want to to chat more. I'm not sure what's the state of Blackboard right now, but yeah, if uh, if people want to chat a bit more casually, I guess we can switch back there. Yeah, I'll put the last time the the link to the repo which is here and this notebook will be uploaded or the last version will be uploaded soon. <laughs> 